Don't hold it too close. It stops. Ah, okay. Hello, my name is Donaldson. Yes. Uh, I run my own uh, startup called Shukra. So, any any network engineers here? Just out of curiosity, any network engineers? <laughs> So, before I start, I will just tell you a little bit about my company. So, Shukra is a telecommunication startup. We actually developing our own proprietary SDN stack. So, our focus is wide area networking and inter AS routing. So, SDN is software defined networks. Too close. So, the, the topic. Today is how do you do SDN programming with Golang? So to understand what is SDN, right? We first need to know what is network programmability. Then we need to know how does it, how, how, what does it got to do with the OSI reference with SDN architecture, and following by decoupling of the forwarding plane, control plane, and finally how to actually use Go for all of this. What's NFS? Uh, NFS is a, is a software. It's a specific library. Uh, I later go through, then you will see where it comes in. So, in net, so the whole thing about software-defined networks, right, is we are focusing on something called network programmability. So, network programmability is the capacity to initialize, control, manage network behavior through open interfaces. So, so network programmability has always been there. If you are familiar, you might know about like routing protocols that have always been used in the network. Those are all network network uh, programmability. So software defined networking is a specific type of network programmability, right? Where you separate the control and forwarding plane. So what, what are those control and forwarding plane? So we need to know some uh, terminology. So the forwarding plane is the collection of all network devices that is responsible for forwarding packets. This is also known as a data plane. Okay. And then the control plane is the collection of functions that instruct the network functions network devices how to process and forward packets and then following there is a management plate right this is the collection of functions that's responsible for monitoring configuring and uh, managing network devices so you all might be familiar with of things like snmp simple network management protocol <laughs> the protocol is simple but it's not simple to use it's very e painful to use so these are so so why, why we need to talk about the network programmability is because what happens is when you have SDN, suddenly OSI doesn't seem so useful for SDN. Why? Because OSI, right, or you can talk about TCP IP, which is basically the same layer architecture, is that the paradigm describes computer networking between two hosts. Right? So we are only interested in sending data from one host to another host, right? And making sure that, that the data is transmitted. So when you do that, you realize there's a problem, right? Network topology, network services, network management, right? They don't actually fit inside the OSI model. So your SDN actually doesn't use the OSI model because OSI model is not applicable. So SDN, right, is an alternative way to look at, an alternative way to architect, alternative way to describe the architecture for a computer network. Sorry, can, can you elaborate on the last point? Oh, the last point is saying that okay, so network topology, right? Like, so when you look at uh, the OS, uh, is you only have two hosts, right? But the network, there are actually multiple nodes inside the network, right? There are routers, there are switches. All these are not actually being mentioned inside the OSI, right? We simply put them in the black box away. So actually, they are inside. You know, they are inside layer two, layer three. You can't see them. They've been black box away. So most of the time when we program, we only we like for us when we do a normal application, we only do up to layer four, right? We do layer three up to this is done within our servers. We don't actually bother anything here onwards below. Layer four and layer seven. Yep. So the SDI architecture actually looks like that. So so the SDI architecture what happened is you have the forwarding plane and the control plane. So the forwarding plane will include the description. The control plane and the forwarding plane together, they will contr the control plane will have information like the network topology. So what happens is, then you have the management plane. So management plane is in charge of monitoring, mo monitoring stuff. So like for example, right, you tell the forwarding plane, let's say I want to measure like how many packets, how, how long this packet 
is, is stuck in this router for how many nanoseconds you want to measure right so you know okay that, that this particular switch is actually a bottom so you want to be able to measure right once measure needs to report the value so your folding plane which is your switches they will need to actually measure and then they need to forward the data that's measured into the management plane which will then trigger the control plane to do something about it like for example that you would say that i need to reroute the traffic to a different switch or provide uh, multiple pathways instead of just one pathway for one particular so that i can load balance the traffic so the SDI architecture basically looks like that lah. so what happened is we will be focusing on talking about the folding plane because once we know how to decouple the folding plane, right, then the rest is actually pretty much standard architecture. Like for example, when you talk about how people build controllers, those are pretty much standard stuff. Like for example, how you build a distributed program, how to build a distributed controller. So to, in order to decouple, right, we will be discussing how to use it in Golang. So, in, so what happened is I'll be using something called the DPTK, which is the Data Plane Development Kit. So data plane development kit is originally uh, launched by Intel, right? but now uh, all the various other network vendors, they all use it now. So Marvel, Mellanox, KVM, they all support it. So even actually your, your KVM, if you use KVM, you'll find that the virtual machines on KVM will support this. So why you mentioned about NFF Go, right? what is it? So NFF Go actually provides the Go binding to the DBTK. What does NFF stand for? Uh, stand for uh, Network Function Framework. Ah, thanks. So what is DBDK? So th what DBDK does is, uh, is have anyone here done game development? Graphics development for games? It's a very similar concept to what they do So in, in gaming. So what DBDK does essentially is it provides a way for you to manipulate the network devices through user land. Which is the same thing which is happening in gaming development where they use uh, Vulkan to use to access the graphics, the GPU through, through user land without going through the kernel so you can avoid contact switches. So DBDK is a driver that does that. And NFGo is a framework that talks to DBDK driver. So you need to install DBDK onto the server before you can use DBDK. So there are some little quirks with using DBDK is like for example, you need to set up uh, huge pages. So if you all know what uh, virtual memory and paging, right? So on default, on default, the Linux pages are only uh, four kilobytes. So when what happens is you when you want to access the packets which are stored in the computer main memory, right? You don't want context switching. So end up you want your pages to be as big as possible. So you can actually set up one gigabyte huge pages. Consumes all the memory. Uh, not really. In the data center, we are easily talking about what? 512 gigabyte is nothing. So, so the idea is uh, to use NFGo, right? The NFGo makes our life very easy when you actually want to write, some, uh, write a packet processor, right? So, you just simply need to import these two libraries, which is the flow and the packet. Right. And after that, you need to know what is the skeletal program. It's just a bare minimum. You can add any functions depending on what you need to do with it. Is that it must consist of packet processing graph, a UDF, and uh, an optional interface for commuting with an external controller. So, one thing about the, U, about the packet processing graph is that it consists of an entry, transient, and exit nodes. And UDFs, right? They are they can be attached to each flow. So UDFs, in one in some way, you it might look to you like say they are like the middleware in the HTTP router. So UDFs are something like that. They are conceptually similar, but not exactly the same thing. So the UDFs are responsible for modifying the packet content, and they can also use for updating the flow counters and updating the program state. So you can use this for orchestrating. This is used for measurement. So, so when you write the program, right, the last part is, of course, you need to add an optional, optional interface to communicate as another controller. So it can be any kind of API, right? It can be RPC, it can be gRPC, it's up to you, depending on what you want to implement, right? Or my favorite is actually SMPP. If you all remember, does anyone know what SMPP is? Or is it a bit too ancient? Ancient. 
Have you remember? Do you still anyone use Google Chat? Google Chat, you know, remember Jabber? Yes. SMPP is Jabber. Yeah. So this is actually a chat protocol. Of course, there are alternatives to using SMPP like OpenFlow, which is specifically meant for that, but I don't like OpenFlow for other reasons. <laughs> so NFF runs as a userland program yes. on your host. Yes. And it's compatible with any NIC which the host no. supports. No, the NIC are the one which um, they must be DPTK compatible. So I mentioned a few uh, manufacturers. So it's like Intel, KVM, uh, actually, actually Marvel, your Broadcom also support, Qualcomm also support. A lot of the major, but you need to check which network card support. Not all their network card support. So I was talking about a packet processing graph, right? I will need to explain some things. So when you look at a packet processing graph, right, there's actually three type of nodes, like entry, transient, and exit. Right? Exit just means it comes out here. That's the reason why I draw it in such a way, right? It's because you cannot have loops. You cannot have loops. This thing what happens is this program doesn't check for you. So if you write a packet processing graph, end up with a loop, you will just you will just hang. That is the trade-off for speed. You want speed, then they don't check. So, so in order to do that, right, you need to tell the, you need to when you you need to initialize program, you need to tell tell the server what's happening, right? So, say I want to reserve eight logical calls to use for this program. So, zero to seven means I will reserve logical call zero to seven for the NAF go. This is NFF Go, right? Has its own scheduler which is independent from the Go default scheduler. So the Go scheduler will still run, but they are scheduling different things. So these are host calls? Logical okay. calls, yes. Host calls and not big calls? Yes. Okay. Because we are actually using the CPU to process the packet. Okay. So, like, so I'll talk about having a management interface, right? If you run an API there, right? Your Go default scheduler will run there. The Go default scheduler will not touch this part. This part will be handled by NF Go with its own, with its own uh, scheduler. And after that, you just launch the packet processor with the flow.system start. So how do you create a node, right? It's entry nodes. So when you follow the first line, right? Flow one, set, receiver. Just this just means that my port zero, yeah, let's say I set this as port zero. So port zero, all the all the network packets that go into port zero will become flow one. This is what it means. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you want to generate the packets on the spot, so you use this to generate packets. So you have a UDF. If you use UDF, you can use to specify what kind of packet you want to go and what kind of packet. Then this will generate the packet for you, and you come on the flow. So. So speed is basically literally describe how fast you want it to be, which is in actually a million, uh, I think is uh, packets per second, this is in PPS. And then context is, this is basically a struct for you to store any values that you want to hold. This is basically a struct that is defined by you. So you, sometimes you might want to use a struct to contain state information. So you put the struct there. So you want to update the state, so you update this context. And then another program that uses the same context will be able to read the thing. And then another way to generate uh, packets is to basically read from a PCAT file. Everyone heard of PCAT files? Okay. You, if you use Wireshark, you can actually go and record the network packets going through. So this is actually basically let, let you replay the traffic. Yep. And then after that, you next you need to know exit notes, right? How to stop the flow. So you literally stop the flow by just set stopper because the flow when exit there are only two ways right? either it stops the flow when stop it means drop packets or it gets out so you have port 0, port 1, port 2, port 3 so it goes out to which port or 
you want the packet to be stored inside a file so this is for writing to a PK file so you ask yourself what, what is this port number where does it come from so what happened is when you register the when you set up the dbdk you need to register actually the the the, the ports to the dbdk driver so the first port that you register is called port zero the second port that you register is called port one so this this port number is specific to what you set up before the program it's not actually specified inside the program is it a one-to-one -one mapping from port to interface it can be up to you because sometimes you can even map uh, logical ports Oh, logical ports are very interesting so what happened is uh, logical ports can be like for example it can be a VPN you run a VPN program to listen to a logical port so whatever packets that go through the VPN program it will be rerouted through a VPN to somewhere else so logical ports are actually quite interesting there are many things you can do with logical ports So the more important one are the transient nodes. This is what happens when you do in between, right? So there is a, there's one type called the separator. So what the separator requires is that the UDF, right, must return true or false. If it returns true, then it will the packet. So what happens is the UDF will process packet by packet. So if the UDF returns true for the current packet, that packet will stay in flow one. If it returns false, it will go to the rejected flow. So this allows you to basically create a second a branch out from the main flow. And then the other kind is the output flow. So the, the other one is the splitter. This allows you to basically split a single flow into three or four, depending on how many packets you want to, how many flows you want to, right? So the UDF will need to return. So have, for example, right, if I have I split this into three flows, right? So my UDF must return either zero, one, or two. So it will know that it goes to which flow. So this output flow is actually an array of uh, three flows. If num outflow is three. La. And finally we have a, a partitioner with nm. So what this means right is let's say I set n equals to two, m equals to eight, right? So what happened is when the when the, the when the UDF received the first packet, when, when this one received the first packet, if n equals two, the first two packet will, will remain in the main flow. The last eight packets will go to M flow. So remember when all this and then finally there's a merge flow where you can combine several flows into a single flow. So when you do that, <coughs> you need to always remember these are transient nodes. So all these splitting, merging, whatever, they are all taking place on the CPU, right? They actually haven't gone out onto the network ports yet. So you can always remerge them later and do whatever you want. So this is the UDF. The UDF, right? You just simply specify the UDF, and you just say, it's just simply I just attach a handler to the direct flow. These UDFs are written in Go. Yes, all these UDFs are written in Go. So the so the UDFs they have several types, right? So there is a handler function type. So the handler function type, the first parameter is a packet, the second parameter is a context, and then there's a vector handler type. So you can actually can process packets through as a vector. And then finally you have a separate function. So this one returns true or false, right? Yeah, you just want to say it. And then you one thing you must remember is that the packet modification always take place inside the UDF. So the first parameter right, of the UDF is the packet itself. So that's why you can directly modify the packets. So the packet is an object with its own cell methods, which you can use to that modify. What is the type of the packet? Is it just a byte, like a byte? Like uh, uh, the packet is actually, what happens is the packet is actually a byte. Uh, it's not a byte, it's... Is it a layer 2 or layer 3? Yeah. Structure. Oh, no, no. This packet, you can, it can actually go all the way up to layer 7. Okay. So what happens is the most basic, the most... Hello? Hello? Low battery. Uh, okay. Okay. Shout. Okay, so so what happened right is the when so okay. What happened is 
the byte when it comes in, it will automatically be interpreted as a Ethernet frame. Okay. So Ethernet frame, so, it will come in as an Ethernet frame. Then after the Ethernet frame, as you, so the thing will read this way, right? So you know, know that the, the the way network protocols work is they encapsulate one another. So you, the most outer layer is the Ethernet frame. Then the inner layer is then followed by your L3. Then you follow by your L4, then your L5, your L6, then your L7. Yep. So what happened is the whole thing is just is actually a slice of bytes. How big? We don't really know. Because it could yeah. be smaller. Because, because, because the byte size is variable. But they have a certain minimal size. Depending on how many headers you have in advance. But there's a template comes in the header. Yes, this, these templates are actually standardized. So it's like... For, for, for example, the TCP standard they have specified, like for example, the first 12 bytes is for what, the next yeah. 10 bytes is for what, what kind of headers and what they mean. So all this, if you want to know, you just need to go and look up the actual uh, IRC mm -hmm. for the for the packets. Oh, I, I can see now, packet get IPv4, no check, etc. Yep. So, so, get UDP. Okay. so, so this method will just give you the headers. So once you get the header, you can just modify the header. Once you modify the header, that's it. You just directly update the header and then the packet is just modified. So what, why no check, right? It just means, because what happens, there's two variants. There's either the check variant or the no check variant. Can you modify payloads? Yes. So you can do encryption, encryption carding? Yes. In fact, what happens in DBTK, right, is uh, you can actually uh, register, uh, this is the fun part of DBTK, you can register hardware encryption device onto the DBTK driver. And then you can use NSF Go to actually redirect the packets into the hardware encryption to do the encryption for you. Nice. That's why all the big support, all the big network vendors also support decide to support this also. Nice. They didn't know this existed. So, so how does an IPv4 header look like, right? So we were talking about like the format. So this gives you the format I'm saying you. So like for example, the version number, the type of service, the total length, the packet ID, the fragment offset, time to leave. So the source address. So normally like if you are doing an NAT function, right? You never address translation. You just want to update the source. You just want to change the destination address. Yep. So you just take the IPv4 header you get, you just change this part and that's it. Your job is done. If you're just doing an NAT function. And then the same is similar for the IPv6. <coughs> and then if you want to modify the TCP header, you can get the TCP header. Then actually, and you can do, you can also directly modify the UDP header. And uh, there are also more interesting things you can do. Like for example, there's an additional function, right? It's, it's called uh, add VLAN tag. So you can actually add a VLAN tag to the thing. VLAN is for network virtualization. So it's like creating a virtual network on a real onto a real network. So you use it to like logically separate two networks. Although they are on the same physical network, they just cannot see each other. Does so, NFF have protocols like spanning tree built in? This one you can this one no. This one you just depend on your switch. You don't need NFF. So NFF is more useful as a smart nick. It means you make your network card very smart, but then all the all the heavy, heavy duty like spanning tree and all that. So you it's just not designed to, to be a smart switch, but a smart nick. Yes. Okay. Because a lot of the switches already have it. You don't have to. It's very easy. My daughter program. I just buy a switch and plug in the wire. That's it. Uh, that's it. All that's coding work. A special switch. Oh, you can make your own. Nobody's stopping you. It's just not inside the library. Hmm. Got it. So, so yes, this is it. Thank you. Interesting. What what do you use this for? Uh, you can use this to write cloud functions. So, like for example, in you can, so uh, AWS support this. So on AWS, you can spin up a VM. To you can spin up a VM and use it as a switch. Ah, got it. Uh, so hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. Or you okay, you can use this to write like for example you want to do deep packet inspection. So you want to be able to get the get the data off the packets and then after that do some deep packet inspection. That you talk about reading the payload, right? Yep. That's your deep packet inspection. Yep. 
So people use this for that. So it's like you go to the AWS marketplace, you see all those, you see all those smart firewall, all those, they are written using things like, they are written using this. Interesting. Um, and it sounds like uh, this has a, a little bit more smaller scale use case. You can write your own load balancer. <laughs> So like, you know, I mean, seriously, you can write your own load balancer because it's like you all use Nginx, right? So Nginx got one very nice feature which is not free. It's basically you want to check the load on your, on your proxy, your load balance instances at the back, right? So you know whether you want to spin out or spin down, right? Yeah. But then to do that, you need to be able to perform a health check. So the free Nginx doesn't let you do that, right? So, so you do, you use this, you can actually write your own load balancer Expected and do the check. Control your Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> so this this particular MF Go is actually meant for cloud networking, not so much for hardware. If you do hardware, we still prefer doing C. So if you launch a VM in the cloud, is it DPDK supported? You need to get the one AWS has a certain ones which are supported. Ah. Uh, so you need to find out which one. I just remember it, AWS has some v, some VMs that support this, not all of them. So you need to have a specific instance type. Yep. So how, how, how would that work? Because like, well, VMs don't really have a physical link, right? No, it doesn't matter. Because what happened is, it, because what happened is, uh, your actual network card has something called virtual machine queues. Vert IO. So what happened is the vert IO in the VM in the hypervisor will actually link it to a virtual machine queue onto the onto the actual NIC. So a physical NIC can appear as uh, as for example thirty two virtual network network cards on the on, in the OS, and then you take that switch and you PCI pass through to your. So like uh, if the physical card supports it, like the virtual card also. Yes. Is there any specific way of testing this? Like, do you use because the the routing thing can can get quite buggy if you don't know what you're doing. So, do you use formal specification or any way of testing testing your flows? Hmm. <coughs> or do you just have to trust your? Is, is there a testing framework or testing library? Testing library. Honestly, I never seen it. Honestly, I never seen it before. You have to be really smart to write this, I guess. <laughs> no, the trouble with embedded systems is you have to realize it to test it. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> but this is a lot way easier to write your own load balancer compared to compared to how the way they probably wrote Nginx from scratch. Yeah. Because you're dealing with the raw packets. Ah. Yeah. And therefore a lot more efficient. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, this this actually performs comparable. Okay, okay. Potentially a lot more efficient. Of course, don't compare with an async. I mean, you can't compare with silicon. But I, I think it'll be quite effective. No, it's actually catching up. Uh, for silicon, actually, what we do is there's a, another way to program the for folding plane. Uh, yeah. Is there's something called P4. So I actually use P4. So P4, P4 is uh, based on a pipeline and matching. So you actually, what you do with P4 is you take P4 code. Can NFF go past P4? No. No. Okay. So it's all written in code. Ma. But P4, you write already, you can compile the micro code and then you can upload the micro code it into a hardware switch, yeah. which can run it. So, so far in the market, only uh, Tofino, the Tofino CPU is the only one that can directly run the P4 micro code. So they actually use this inside the big data centers. So like Google, AWS actually does use P4 switches. And P4 switches are not very, are not cheap. No, partly because, no, my reason is not as complicated. It's very simple. This is a GoTalk. It's not a CPAC <laughs> stop. <laughs> But would you use C or use Go? Or C? I don't like C. <laughs> or C that's what I, I, I just use C. Yeah, so, uh, so between C and Go in production, what would you choose? If I'm doing hardware, I will touch C. But for cloud functions? Cloud functions, this is fine. This is actually meant for cloud functions. Go or C? 
the MF Go is meant for use for the cloud. You can of course do C, uh, but they what they do is what Intel did was they make this is a really accessible library for you to write your own network functions. So actually, cloud can further evolve. Yeah. Otherwise, network will just be a dumb pipe in the cloud. But with this, it won't be. Yeah. Nice talk. Thanks. Ah.